I am joined by Felix Javin, macro analyst at Reflexivity Research. Felix, great to have you here. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, you are an up and coming star in the world of macro research. Just quickly tell us uh, what's your framework? How do you go about analyzing markets? How important to you are cycles, central banks, stuff like that? Totally. So I, I view the world in, in two major frameworks. There's the framework around liquidity and how that affects assets overall from a global macro basis, as well as, you know, key inflection points in terms of key events within the macro and, uh, you know, overall cyclical and uh, secular business cycles. So, you know, overall combining those two aspects to start to derive where I see assets moving forward. So for me, that first liquidity framework that I use is, you know, what myself and many call this idea of net liquidity. And for myself, that framework, you know, it, it, it really came originally from, you know, you think about over the past few years, ever since the original onset of, of the COVID pandemic, where we saw the Fed Federal Reserve balance sheet uh, absolutely explode higher. And around that time, you saw a lot of a lot of people start to compare as we start to see the mar the equity market bottom out and start to rebound higher. We started to see people compare these charts of, well, look, you know, the NASDAQ is effectively tracking the federal balance sheet. And, you know, potentially all that's occurring here is that liquidity is is entering the market at, you know, paces that have never been seen before, and that's causing equities to rise higher. And so we saw that occur over the, the following couple of years in 2020 and 2021. But what was interesting is that what occurred following that. So, you know, what happened is that around December 2021, January 2022, we started to see the market send and risk assets start to roll over. But, you know, that they were still the Federal Reserve is still doing quantitative easing at that time. So there was a lot of questions occurring about what was really driving this. This was also around the same time that, you know, Jerome Powell started to come out and say, you know, we can retire the word transitory in terms of inflation. We're seeing CPI really creep up aggressively. But what was happening underneath the surface was that there was some significant changes happening in underlying liquidity dynamics. And if you were somebody that was only paying attention to the federal balance sheet, you would have missed that in your analysis. So there was two other components that were changing quite drastically at the time. The first one was the, the Treasury General account, which is the, the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury is effectively, you know, checking account at the Federal Reserve when they issue debt. Uh, that is generally speaking where, where the money goes and they can use that either to, you know, provide, you know, interest payments on that debt or to go towards, you know, basically uh, fiscal uh, spending effectively. So what had happened is that over, you know, those couple of years, you know, knowing where Congress is going in terms of their fiscal stimulus that they're providing into the pandemic in terms of all that fiscal expansion, they had issued a ton of debt. And we saw the U.S. TGA account actually rise up to $1.5 trillion at the time. And that was by far, you know, one of the, the, a huge, a huge delta increase in terms of what that notional value of the TGA account was at the time. So we had reached this point where there is, there was a ton of money in sitting in that TGA account. And, you know, due to uh, outlook from, from uh, Secretary Yellen, that they wanted to draw that down. But if they wanted to draw that down, that would have provided an insane amount of liquidity into the market at a time where we are already seeing, you know, these, you know, this was at the same time that GameStop was was going off at some of these, you know, type of bubble bubble events that we kept seeing pop off. If we saw, you know, a trillion dollars, you know, get run down from the DGA account at the time, that would that would just make things worse at a time where CPI was rising significantly. So while that was all occurring. What had happened is that on the side, the Federal Reserve had come in and decided that they would actually start to provide a yield on their reverse repo uh, policy. So effectively, what that they did is that this is this is a, a place where you know primary dealers and money market funds can enter and effectively borrow uh, T bills and and basically post up uh, collateral for, in exchange for that. And what they had decided to do is provide a five basis point yield there. And this was at a time where yields were still at zero, the rates were still at zero, Fed funds rate was still at zero. So what this did is that it allowed them to effectively sterilize a ton of liquidity out of the market as they were drawing down the TGA account and letting that transfer effectively onto the reverse repo account, which is effectively outside of the financial system. It's not being used as collateral, it's just sitting on the federal balance sheet. It was a way to sterilize those assets. 
So this was all happening at that time where they were still doing quantitative easing, but they're actually decreasing liquidity at the same time. Sort of, you know, only people that were really in the weeds of the plumbing could actually notice that occur. So this is where we saw effectively $2 trillion get sterilized out of the market and onto the reverse repo balance sheet at the Federal Reserve. And this is at the same time that if you track risk assets and if you basically net it out, if you took the changes in federal balance sheet, took off the, the change in TGA account and the change in reverse repo, that actually started to fix your correlation and you could see it track liquidity. So for myself, that liquidity framework, just to sum it up, is really looking at those three factors and how they interplay and how that leads to increases or decreases in liquidity. And what we've seen so far is that paired with the second you know, framework that I mostly use of thinking about, you know, where will rates go, where will monetary policy go, and where will fiscal policy go moving forward. So as we started to see them begin to transfer to this more hawkish stance of, you know, going through the quickest uh, rate hiking policy in history, you know, going for an incredibly aggressive quantitative tightening campaign, which was really, you know, they felt confident doing because they had that $2 trillion sitting in the reverse repo that they felt that as they started to increase quantitative tightening, that they could, you know, allow that to draw down and ensure that liquidity didn't get too broken, knowing that that was there potentially, because what could occur is that as they're going through quantitative tightening, money market funds could actually exit that reverse repo and go and chase off higher yields potentially in shorter end bonds. So those two frameworks that I know that's a lot all at once, but it's really how I start to frame out how I think about things. That's brilliant. Thank you, Felix. So just to break things down a little bit, quantitative easing, the, bench, the central bank prints uh, bank reserves and then buys assets from commercial banks almost all the time, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. As a result, the monetary base goes up. And often what you see is M2, uh, you know, money supply will go up too because what commercial banks will do is uh, they've just sold their treasury, so they have to buy, get them back their treasury, so they buy it from their own clients. And then clients have a bunch of deposits, and that's measured in the, the money supply. So you know, mm -hmm. the charts of money supply go up during quantitative easing, and it's very stimulative, particularly to asset prices. But in terms of Causing inflation, the the effect has just, you know historically been quite weak. If you look at Japan, which is you know, the biggest QE in the world, um, you, you had deflation while QE was was going on uh, in, 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 in mass. Uh, however, if the central bank buys a lot of uh, government bonds, when the government issues a ton of bonds during a crisis when yields are super low, as a result. Uh, the, the treasury, the government has, uh, you know, one and a half trillion or I mean, $1.7 trillion in the mm -hmm. treasury general account. And that money can be used to spend on all sorts of things. And uh, when the government spends money, that can be inflationary, as you saw with the stimulus checks, um, with you know, un unemployment benefits, PPP, uh, you know, often overlooked as a sign of sort of government stimulus uh, during that period. But, but in order to curb that tide, to sterilize the liquidity, mm -hmm. Secretary Yellen of the treasury uh, started this reverse repo facility. Okay, I don't think she started it because I've looked at the chart and it, it, it's existed before, right? So It's existed, uh, but there was no yield on it. That was above the federal funds. So there's no real incentive for money market funds to go there because there's no yield. Unless in a crisis. Unless in a crisis, yes. Right. Okay, and uh, this might be a very hard to answer, but isn't it the case that interest on reserve balances, IORB, is slightly higher than the reverse repo? Is there a limit to putting money in that facility? I do believe it's higher. I don't know if there's a limit. I know the reverse repo, obviously, every time they hike Fed funds, they also hike the, the rate right. at the at reverse repo. It's at 4.3% right now, I believe. Um, not 100% sure if there's a limit on interest in excess reserves. Uh, but overall, I think, you know, the calculus that you're getting at there is that there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity costs that money market funds are analyzing and deciding where to allocate. And, you know, for now, I think what's really interesting about reverse repo is that it's it's the most risk free, you know, yielding asset that we've ever seen. Because if you think about if, you, if you're putting on your hat on as pretending to be a money market fund, you're trying to decide where to allocate capital a lot. You know, if, if you go and, and buy like a one month uh, T-bill that still has, you know, a little bit of duration exposure versus something like reverse repo where there's none whatsoever. It's it, it's, it's completely aside. There's the, the least amount of risk that we've ever seen in something. So it it it. It makes sense that we've seen so much capital fly there just because of those reasons. Right. So how big did the reverse repo facility get? We, we can put up a chart uh, 
of it and just ex- just explain how this is sort of sucking in money that would otherwise go into financing projects, spending, uh, um, you know, bank bank activity and how it's just kind of like a black hole. Totally. So, yeah, what we've seen is that we've are the biggest peak we've hit is just about two point four trillion dollars. So, you know, that that really began in effectively, you know, late, uh, you know, like April 2021 is when we started to see that that yield occur that was slightly above the Fed funds rate. And that's where we started to see this transfer of assets into there. So, you know, from basically there up until now, we've seen this huge increase in, in deposits at the reverse repo up to $2.4 trillion. You know, we often get these, uh, you know, quarterly window dressing exercises where we'll see, you know, f- funds flow more into the re- reverse repo at those end of quarter uh, rebalancing effects. And then that'll start to shift after the quarter is over. But generally speaking, you know, for the past few months, we've been pretty flat there. We saw a, a pretty significant downtick in those balances there. So what, if you think about the past, you know, two months, we've seen a pretty sizable bear market rally. And that has coincided quite significantly with a with a fairly sizable de- a decrease in the reverse repo balance. And, you know, my, my general, you know, shorthand framework for how to analyze where that, uh, that money is flowing is comparing the yield at the reverse repo with the yield of, say, a one month uh, a T-bill, which is currently yielding actually below quite significantly after the recent uh, rate hike. You know, the, the one month T-bill is yielding at 3.78% right now. The reverse repo is at 43 and you have, you know, zero market exposure effectively. It's completely inside of the financial system. So it makes a ton of sense for money market funds to allocate there right now, especially when we're in such a volatile environment that we are. Right. The yield curve is extremely downward sloping, not just in the twos, tens, but you know, vary on the short end of the curve. So pretty much the most you can ever make on your money is going to be over the next six months because we're, we're approaching yeah. the terminal rate and we're approaching it fast. Um, yeah. So that makes sense why reverse repo would yield uh, higher than a treasury bill. Also from a uh, you know, friend of the show, Joseph Wang's excellent piece on mm-hmm. fedguy.com called Trap Liquidity, money market funds are flocking mm-hmm. to the reverse repo, as you just said, for the reasons. Meanwhile, Individuals Households. are actually buying treasury bills hand over fist because, and this is according to Joseph, uh, money market funds are charging a fee. Uh, they're like, oh, we, we, can, we can charge a fee because the yields mm-hmm. are so high. So individuals are, are going to the treasury. So it's actually individual how, uh, households, you know, private investors who are buying uh, treasuries, short term treasuries, rather than the money market funds who are going flocking to the repo and also reverse repo. And um, I just want to say the, the reverse repo facility is a lot more centralized, at least on paper, than the prior system of the federal funds rate. You know, mm-hmm. when the FOMC says, oh, we're hiking interest rates to between 4.25% and 4.50%, the headline number that everyone cares about is the federal funds rate. But that is a shadow of what it once was mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, we now are in an ample uh, uh, reserve regime. And all of all, you know, so much of the actions happens in the reverse repo facility. And under the federal, you know, when I went in college, my first learned about it, I was like the Fed funds rate. I'm like, oh, that's how much banks can earn from the Fed. And I was actually wrong. <laughs> it's how much banks can earn from lending to each other overnight uh, on an unsecured basis. And the Federal Reserve used to impact that by altering the quality of quantity of reserves. But in the wake of the great financial crisis, there's t- too many reserves. Um, so they do this b- by this new means. And that is what my flawed conception was. Of It, it pretty much is the uh, bank, uh, the um, it's essentially a deposit facility. It's not actually that, but people can earn, earn yield directly from the Federal Reserve. Okay, so now that we've uh, you know gotten a little into the weeds on the plumbing, explain to me the connection between net liquidity and asset prices. Um, what is the index that you, you use? Can you just give us sort of a, a, a simple um, equation or you know, a, a, a simplification of it? And then, yeah, uh, what's the correlation between risk assets and, and what is liquidity doing right now? By, by the way, we're recording on the 20th of December. Absolutely. So the, the shorthand equation that, you know, basically anybody with a trading view account can can plug in for themselves and, and start to track is effectively the, the federal balance sheet uh, SOMA portfolio minus the TGA account minus the, the balance of the RRP effectively. So, you know, that makes intuitive sense because as TGA account and RRP decrease, 
that is effectively, you know, stimulus coming, liquidity coming into the market. And as they increase, that's liquidity coming out. Because if that balance of RFP increases, that's more liquidity that's being sterilized outside of the system. So that's the formula we use. We can, you know, we can post the, the actual, you know, what you could input uh, so everybody can track it themselves in the description. But effectively, what you can do is, is set up that equation and then start to track it against, you know, both, you know, say the NASDAQ index, the S&P 500, uh, index. I've used it to track, uh, you know, things all, far out on the risk curve uh, that are, you know, I view as, as effectively speculation vehicles uh, for oncoming liquidity. So looking at, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, even looking at the, the ARK ETF, these are, these are, you know, speculative vehicles that have so, somewhat been adopted as as places to speculate on that forward liquidity. So, if you overlay any any sort of those those charts, they do track really nicely to net liquidity. So, effectively, you know how they promote quantitative tightening is that it's something that's running in the background. That there's the 95 billion dollars a month that is you know being rolled off the balance sheet. Uh, you know, where a certain portion of that is uh, MBS, uh, mortgage-backed securities. And then another portion is obviously treasuries as they start to expire and roll off the balance sheet. And they like to promote that as you know, effectively happening in the background. At the onset, when that policy was implemented, a beginning quantitative tightening, they had some sort of discrepancies in terms of the mechanics of how they account for the MBS that made it look like quantitative tightening was not happening, but it was happening. It's just the you know, the plumbing of, of effectively how uh, MBS is, is amortized and how that affected. But now we're, we're right in the meat of it. That 95 billion is, is happening, generally speaking, every month fairly consistently. And the changes in the marge on the margin are really happening in the TGA account and where that is going, as well as the RRP. So the TGA has been actually coming down quite a bit, despite the fact that Secretary, Secretary Yellen last month had guided towards having the TGA account sit at 700 billion by the end of the year. We're not seeing that, you know, it's actually been coming down somewhat recently. We're hovering around that $400 billion right now. So if that were to happen, you know, it's, it's December 20th, that's very late in the game for that to occur. You know, I think best case scenario is we see that get up to 500 billion, but that's still generally speaking, a decrease in net liquidity from the TGA aspect. Right. When and look so, sorry, so a, mm -hmm. the TGA going Treasury General account going up indicates that the Treasury is issuing collateral, issuing Treasury bills, notes, bonds, and receiving cash, receiving uh, bank reserves and, and just, you know, real money. Um, exactly. Treasuries are real money, too. But uh, so that would that going up would be a drain on net liquidity. So you think uh, TGA will go up to, yeah. say, 500 billion and that will be a drain on liquidity, too. That would be a drain on liquidity. So if, if we if we call it, you know, just for, for simple arithmetic, we say that we're at 400 billion right now and we're going to get to 500 billion in the next few weeks. Well, that's 100 billion dollars taken out of uh, net liquidity. So we've got 95 coming out from QT. We got another 100 coming out from TGA. That's already nearly 200 billion over the next you know month or so. And then when we start to shift our, our perspective to reverse repo. Uh, you know, the, the, the picture gets even more complicated, but effectively what's happening there is that my framework right now is that we just saw a recent hike uh, from the FOMC committee. Obviously, that's brought up the the uh, return rate on reverse repo up to 4.3%. That's significantly higher than where we see, you know, say the one month uh, T-bill at 37 So the, the opportunity cost, plus the fact that again, money market funds have zero, zero, like truly zero risk going in the reverse repo. It makes a ton of sense to see that number increase. I don't have a specific target in terms of where I see reverse repo going, but I could see us at least, you know, reaching a local high in the next bit. You know, right now we just we just had the number come in at about a 2.15 trillion balance today. That gets updated on a daily basis, but I could easily see that getting up to 2.3 uh, over the next few weeks as well as we start to see that that spread come in in terms of opportunity costs. And again, tying back to what he had mentioned from uh, Joseph Wang's piece, which was fantastic, some of the analysis there, it really gets to the, 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 the core of the matter of the fact that there's very little reason for money market funds to come out of the reverse repo and start to allocate into the short end of the, of the yield curve. Right, yeah, Joseph's piece ending saying, our understanding of the financial system always suggested that the reverse repo was unlikely. The, the draining of the reverse repo was unlikely, but now it's very unlikely. Quantitative mm -hmm. tightening is effectively proceeding with bank reserves levels at $1 trillion above target and no excess. In this scenario, quantitative tightening can only last several months. 
so why why would quantitative tightening only last several months? Yeah, so you know they have they have certain benchmarks that the the Federal Reserve is looking at to ensure you know smooth functioning of uh, the lending markets, which is sort of a, a third hidden you know some may argue uh, policy goal of the Federal Reserve. And so they have these these liquidity benchmarks that they want to make sure they're. And one of them is for commercial banks to just have ample liquidity. And if households are actually coming out and starting to allocate their their money more so into T bills, that's that's liquidity you know sort of shifting in. in away from those benchmarks. So I know that is Joseph Wang's argument roughly around that. But, you know, I think that the debate on the other side of that aspect is that if the Federal Reserve started to get really concerned about that liquidity, they could simply bring down the, the rate on the reverse repo to below the, you know, say the one month by, you know, if, if they tacked it at 3.5 and the one month is yielding at 3.7, you know, you would you'd pretty confidently see a lot of that drain on reverse repo. So, you know, I think Powell has plenty of levers he can pull to really drain that if he really needed to. But there is, of course, you know, it, it, it gets complicated. And I totally see the other side of the argument that that's not something that they want to do, especially because of how it's anchored to those other, you know, short end rates, rates that you had mentioned, like, uh, uh, you know, federal funds rate is, is that they all move in tandem. So that would really start to, you know, possibly break something else elsewhere. So it gets complicated. Right. Uh, Felix, I'm going to ask a question that is I think a very tough question because I, I ask it frequently and I never hear exactly an, an answer that is you know perfectly satis- satisfying to me, which is people say, oh my God, the Fed's going to tighten until, until something breaks. What's going to break? How is it going to break? What's it going to look like? Because I mean, the implication of Joseph Swain's piece is quantitative tightening can only continue for a few months because something can break. And you know, if, if I'm wrong and there's another assumption, um, you know, Joseph can definitely correct me and and I'll you know I will uh, cor- correct that. But <laughs> what, what like what is going to break? You know. Treasury market, corporate bond market, and what will it look like? Yeah, so you know, historically, the things that have broken have been things within this, uh, you know, granular and and sometimes ambiguous uh, short term funding market. So you know, back in 2019, we saw the repo uh, rate skyrocket, and that was one of those things that broke, quote unquote. Um, you know, I t- oftentimes I think every cycle as we go through here, we, we patch this one over here and then we move over here and then we create something like a two, a two trillion dollar reverse repo uh, operation over there. And, you know, it's hard to predict completely within those mechanics where something could break. I think there's, you know, basically to sum it up is that I see there's there's something within something that we've created within this cycle that will have a secondary cascading effect that could break something over here. That's one option is is something could occur there that would break something that is related indirectly, possibly to something we've created recently, like this two trillion dollar balance sheet of reverse repo. That's one option is is the very short term funding markets. The second possibility of of something that breaks is is these more long term issues of both uh, refinancing and just long end yields. So, you know, as we saw what happened with the Bank of England recently, where, you know, Everything that was going on there with with the trustonomics uh, fiscal uh, stimulus that obviously led to her demise as the prime minister quite quickly. Uh, what happened there is that the long end started to effectively go no bid to the point where pension funds were on the brink of of collapse, and that was something that broke and and led to them having to intervene. You know, when we compare to what had just uh, recently came out just last night in terms of the Bank of Japan announcing that uh, they've they've moved their their cap on yield curve control on the 10-year JGB from, you know, 25 basis points to 50 basis points, that's going to have huge cascading effects on the long end of the yield uh, back in the US because they own a trillion dollars you know, the, Japan owns a trillion dollars of, of U.S. treasuries. They're by far the biggest owner in the, holder in the world. If a certain percentage of, of that ownership starts to flow back into domestic bonds in Japan, that's going to lead to further increases in the yield. And we could see something potentially, you know, break there on the long end and have to see the, the, the Federal Reserve, even though, you know, the last thing that they want to do is actually intervene in the markets. The same thing, you know, with the Bank of England is the last thing they wanted to do was intervene in the markets, but they had to intervene in the markets. So that's that's the other side of the equation. So, you know, to really sum that up, is there something on the short end plumbing side that could break based off something that we've created this cycle? Or there's something that could occur from effectively uh, foreign sovereigns and their effect on on the long end of the Treasury market? Right. So there's basically two two risks, credit risk mm-hmm. and interest rate risk, shorter yeah. end yields 
low interest rate, uh, a, a, a small amount of interest rate risk, but you can see still that can blow up as we saw in September of 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, you know, and that's the reason why we now have a repo facility uh, where you know, we've kind of got a, a ceiling and a, and a floor where the floor is the mm-hmm. reverse repo rate and the ceiling is the repo rate. And if interest rates burst higher than that, that's when you have a problem, which is what happened in September 2019. But mm-hmm. the Federal Reserve has, un, in effect, unlimited firepower to stop that. I think now the standing offer is $500 billion a day. No one takes it up because you'd never borrow yeah. at that rate. But yeah. And they said that the chairman can extend that if he, if he needs to. So it's like $500 billion. Oh, and by the way, if it's $502 billion, we got you. If it's $600 billion, we got you. So to me, it seems like the Federal Reserve uh, has done a – a, a, a strenuous job, a lot of yeah. effort to plug that hole. And, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if we had another short-term repo crisis for like risk-free assets like treasuries, but I would be pretty surprised. I, I'm curious about what you think about that, as well as what do you think is more likely to break uh, long-term sovereigns or, you know, credit risk, like, like you know, CLOs, high yield, investment grade mm-hmm. credit, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it, it's almost like they play a game of, of whack-a-mole each cycle. So of course, like you had mentioned, they had fixed the, the repo. They came in and now there's a standing repo facility. You know, back in 2020, we saw that as the world was was shutting down, uh, foreign central banks were basically scrambling for US dollar liquidity and the Federal Reserve had to come in with, with very aggressive swap lines. And now we effectively have a standing swap line facility. So those are there. Those are things that they have patched over. And to your point, they've done a really good job of, of setting those up. And, you know, oftentimes you'll see investors start to look at previous cycles and say, oh, here's the next thing that's going to break. What happens when the repo facility breaks again or something like that? Or, you know, people started to look at everything that was occurring with, with Europe and, and the world there and saying, oh, well, you know, there's going to be there's going to be a huge demand for for swap lines and they're going to have to come in with swap lines and that'll provide liquidity. But again, these have been patched over and fixed. So to their point, they've done a really great job in terms of patching those issues up. But again, this is this is this is a world that is so nuanced in this area of the market that it's, it's very hard to predict. There's these, you know, idiosyncrasies like the one that Joseph Wang has mentioned, where the fact that because of fees on money market funds, this is effectively siloing a certain portion of liquidity. And we just don't know how that could affect things on a, on a medium term late basis. So, you know, I think there's a decent chance of something breaking in the funding markets, but I would put it as quite a bit lower as what could occur on the other side of the equation, which is how foreign sovereigns are affecting things. Because the fact is, we're shifting into this world where all these central banks have hit, you know, a ton of debt. We, we have debt to GDP ratios above 100% in, in a ton of countries. And generally speaking, when we get above that number, things get a lot harder for monetary policy. And as we're seeing that being shifted and and, and butting into the wall of inflation now, even in Japan, where, you know, there's an argument to be made that, you know, this this 50, this 50 basis point that cap on yield curve control has nothing to do with inflation starting to arise in Japan. But, you know, I think it's I think it's starting to to lay the, the groundwork for a shift to a more, a more hawkish uh, policy moving forward. And when you have such an indebted central bank that has traditionally been so dovish, that's going to cause some significant changes. And these are things that are a lot harder for countries to coordinate, especially in an inflationary world where central banks have to start to think a lot more domestically than internationally. So, you know, the, the, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the ECB, they have to, at the end of the day, look out for their own currencies and their own you know, funding markets as a secondary aspect to what the Federal Reserve is doing and how that's affecting uh, you know, the long end of the yield curve. So I think there's entirely a possibility where we could see some sort of a tail risk event uh, that affects the long end. And that could be the trigger that actually has to see the Fed come in and effectively pivot. And, you know, I hate to use the word pivot, but, you know, I, I, I could see that being something that happens in early 2023 at the same time that we're starting to see some encouraging signs from inflation slowing down at a factor, faster pace than most expected. Right. Uh, central banks are, even though they're global, they are in effect joined at the hip. Like if you and I were neighbors and my house is flooding, you can't just be like, oh, Jack, screw you. You know, you're, you're likely my, my flood is going to become your flood. Um, and global bond markets are fungible. If you own a Japanese government bond, a 10 year, let's say, that's the same as owning a 10 year treasury, except it has currency risk. And you can hedge that out with a, with a uh, FX swap. Mm-hmm. So if you know someone was happy owning a treasury yield 
because, oh, the Japanese government bond yields is at 25 basis points. If it's at 50 basis points uh, now, it's on the margin, more attractive. Still not attractive, but on the margin, it gets more attractive. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so that uh, news you said, the, the Bank of Japan's yield curve control, their target rate is still zero, but they've moved the um, uh, like acceptable spread to, to, from 25 basis points to 50 basis points. So now the acceptable range, instead of being negative 25 basis points to 25 basis points, is now negative 50 basis points to positive 50 basis points. But of course, the pressure is on the top end of yields, uh, not the lower. Yeah, I mean, what do you what do you think happens next? What happens next is potentially a nightmare scenario for for Powell and the Fed. Um, you know, my view is, I've, and I've had this view for even before this happened with the BOJ, is that the, the U.S. dollar has peaked, the DXY has peaked, um, but not for any sort of good reasons and certainly not any bullish reasons. I think it's simply because of interest rate differentials and how ahead of the curve the, the U.S. has been on their interest rate hiking cycle. You know, if we assume the fact that, uh, you know, both in the Federal Reserve dot plot and uh, in open markets that the terminal rate is somewhere between, you know, the market's pricing 4.8% roughly, uh, maybe five, the dot plots, uh, you know, pricing in 5.1% on a, on a median basis, you know, we're, we're pretty close to a terminal rate there in terms, and we're going to hold it there. The intention from, from the FOMC is that they're going to reach that terminal rate and hold it flat. But at the same time, what we're starting to see is that Lagarde at the ECB is starting to become a lot more hawkish and talking about actually ramping up and, and implementing quantitative tightening over there and having no signs of any sort of dovishness, plenty of rate hikes to go there. And now we're seeing what's happening at the BOJ. If we assume that, uh, you know, the, this, this pivot towards a more hawkish uh, outlook on the margin, which is, you know, quite hilarious to think that uh, rising the cap of yield curve control is considered hawkish, but, that, you know, that's, that's the state we live in. Uh, but if those are happening that's going to increase the rates of interest rates in those countries. And if you think about the fact that the DXY is largely uh, a a basket that compares US dollar against uh, the euro and the yen, well, if if US rates are staying flat and the ECB and and BOJ are hiking upwards, well, that's going to bring DXY, you know, roughly speaking, down. But at the same time, as we've been talking about, we could still see, and this is what we're seeing in, in the price action today, is we're seeing DXY down, but yields up. And that's that's quite a you know change in regime from what we've seen so far this year. So what I see happening is that we're going to see the DXY come down, down, but it's not necessarily going to be bullish because we're going to have this upward pressure in long-end yields. That's going to affect, of course, uh, you know, just through opportunity costs of, of comparing the risk free rate against uh, risk assets like equities. Well, we're going to see yields go up, risk assets come down, while at the same time, DXY comes down. So I think that's, that's very different from what we've seen so far this year. And that's largely just, you know, caused by those interest rate deferentials. And of course, the fact that if we fast forward, you know, six months from now, if this, if this is continuing and we're starting to see, you know, depending, you know, the tailor risk, of course, is that, uh, the the head of the BOJ will be retiring, uh, you know, I believe roughly uh, February or March. And depending on who comes on and continues from there, if they take the mantle of of turning towards more hawkish, well, that's going to bring DXY even further down and yields potentially higher. And that could actually see the Fed pivot and, you know, enter the market to to fix uh, liquidity issues at the same time that we're still seeing some form of hawkishness. Uh, from other, uh, you know, foreign central banks. And that will have a, a pretty interesting effect on uh, liquidity, on on CPI, and, and of course, uh, recessions. So, you know, moving from there into, you know, my two-year view, roughly speaking, is that, uh, you know, comparing all these aspects I just mentioned, as well as the fact that we're starting to see CPI come down quite significantly, you know, despite the fact that Powell does not want to be an Arthur Burns and he wants to be a Volcker, you know, the fact is game theory is game theory. And, you know, when you when you think about all the aspects we've just described, you know, we, we, we could see them have to intervene in some form or another. And that will be at a time where CPI is just starting to to bottom out. And, you know, I think we're going to bottom out somewhere between three or four percent. And because they're coming back in. And we've never fixed any of these supply issues. All we've done is suppress demand. We've actually not fixed anything on the supply side. We can see CPI, you know, explode in 2024 to potentially double digits quite easily. We haven't fixed anything in terms of the energy markets. Um, that's still a, as big an issue as ever. We've just suppressed demand. Right. Uh, so this pivot that you imagine would be the Federal Reserve trying to cap 
uh, long-term yields, or at least you know, st- stemming the explosion higher of long-term yields. I can imagine a world, Felix, in which you know this nightmare scenario you envision goes higher. The ten-year Treasury goes to five percent, mm-hmm. and the the Fed says, "Okay, above five percent, uh, we're going to be a buyer, and we're going to have a ten basis points range." So basically, the ten-year Treasury is stuck at five point ten zero five point one zero percent. I can also imagine in that world, the Federal Reserve still getting to 5.25%. And I, I feel like yeah. when people talk about pivot, the focus is yeah. really on short-term interest rates. So in that world, even though the Federal Reserve did a drastic action to inject liquidity and re- restore stability to, to the you know funding markets globally, they still get to 5.25%. And mm-hmm. I don't consider that a pivot. Um, so yeah. you know, in the same way, the Bank of England is still t- tightening mm-hmm. monetary policy, even as it did an yeah. intervention in late, in late yeah. de- um, September. Yeah, yeah, you know, perfectly said. And that really gets to, you know, my issue with both uh, the word pivot uh, and its focus on the federal funds rate. And so much of the focus is there on the price of money when, as we've been talking about this entire time, the big changes are happening with the quantity of money and how that's going in and out of the financial system. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, historically, they've never, you know, for example, they they never stopped quantitative uh they never hiked rates before they stopped quantitative easing. There's always one before the other. And they never they never started to do quantitative tightening until they started to hike as well. So the, these have been these holy, you know, processes that they've never wanted to mess with. But as you've just mentioned, the Bank of England has already broken that tradition. They, they went in and started to effectively do quantitative easing on the long end at the same time that they're hiking the short end. So I could definitely see some some idiosyncratic moments where the Fed funds rate is still going to 5%, but they're also doing some operations on the long end. And again, this is some this is stuff that, you know, unless you're a huge uh, you know, financial plumbing nerd like yourself and and myself, you know, we're the ones paying attention on that, but as long as that that Fed funds rate isn't coming down, a lot of the masses won't pay as much attention to it. It's the same thing that happened, you know, back in September 2019, where they came in to uh, to supply liquidity to the to the repo market, and they said, "Oh, it's not quantitative easing. You know, it's mm-hmm. just it's just uh, you know helping ensure ample liquidity at, at and you know normal processes within that market." But you know, we all knew is effectively you know providing liquidity. So we could ter- certainly see this this dynamic where where rates on the short end are still rising or flat. Um, at the same time that they're doing operations on the long end. And I could totally see that happening. Mm. Thanks, Felix, for allying your views on liquidity. Now let's move on to your views on inflation. You said, okay, inflation can ratchet back up in 2024 if there Mm -hmm. is a Fed pivot. But I I get the sense that in the short term, you think inflation is going one way lower. Why why is that the case? Totally. So we've had the second month now of surprises to CPI to the downside from market expectations. You know, this past month, we saw, you know, course CPI on a month over month basis uh, be at 2.2%, where it was forecasted for 0.3. So this is the second month in a row where this has occurred. Um, and yeah, you know, I think that that fact is going to continue. There's a number of reasons. So the first, you know, dynamic that's occurring here is that as we've come out of the pandemic and we've shifted away from, you know, during the pandemic, we were all about buying goods. We were all living at home. We decided to buy a new TV, renovate this, buy that for the garage, all of these different aspects. So that was at the same time that the supply chain was getting shut down. So effectively what happened is that due to the bullwhip effect, which is where retailers see this demand come online for goods, they start to order in a bunch of inventory to match that demand. And as supply chains started to ease, that inventory started to come online just at the same time that the economy was reopening. And we all decided, all right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm done using my Xbox. I'm going to go travel. So what we've seen is that suddenly inventory levels have, have increased quite significantly. And we're starting to actually see goods deflation on a month or month basis. So this has been happening, uh, you know, for the second month in a row now, you know, we've seen transportation goods, uh, month or month uh, inflation, medical, sir, uh, sorry, yeah, transportation goods actually have deflation within it. But what's being offset by that, and while we're not seeing month or month uh, deflation on an aggregate basis quite yet, is that we're still all busy traveling and living up uh, on the services uh, post-pandemic. So we're still seeing inflation in services, 
but we're actually starting to see that now start to top out. So these aspects are all starting to shift lower. So we've, we're seeing goods deflation. We've seen services inflation start to peak out and start to head lower on a month-for-month -month basis. The two other aspects that are affecting a lot of things is thirdly, shelter inflation, which we all know and have discussed about just how lagged it is. And that's by, you know, roughly design. And, you know, that has a lot to do with owner's equivalent owner's equivalent rent and how that's uh, basically tracked and, and managed. But effectively, what we've seen now is that this, this lagging inflation where last month, you know, we were at 0.8% uh, on the month-to-month -month basis inflation for shelter. This month, we're at 0.6. So we're finally peaking out there. And this has been the biggest contributor to, to top line, the biggest uh, top line contributor to inflation. And that's starting to peak and come down as well. And if we just think about, uh, you know, just as a shorthand of, of where US, uh, you know, say pending home sales is at, you know, we're down 37% in pending home sales. That's the, that's the biggest uh, decrease in history. So if we just assume and, and extrapolate that trend to shelter inflation, well, it's safe to assume that fairly soon we will actually see month over month deflation there. So those, all those dynamics are shifting lower. We've seen some of them start to provide us this tailwind of uh, lower inflation than expected. And some of those others are going to start to actually, you know, take up the mantle of providing that for us, like shelter inflation. Now, the only, you know, tail risk to this idea of uh, lower inflation than expected is, is oil and energy. So from a headline basis, what we've seen over the past few months, uh, you know, notably because of what's been happening with the Biden administration and uh, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that has brought a ton of oil online at the same time that the market has started to price in a recession and a decrease in demand. So we've seen, you know, not many people have, have, have clued into this fact, but U.S. oil is effectively I believe it's either flat or slightly negative year to date, despite everything that's happened with the Russia Ukraine war, all of that, you know, we're, we're effectively at flat. So that has provided a huge tailwind for headline uh, CPI to come lower on a month from month basis. Um, now we're at this point where you could argue this risk upcoming recession is nearly priced in, you know, just roughly speaking, my internal framework is that we've we priced in, say, 80% or 70 to 80% of a recession within commodities. That plus the fact that the SPR is starting to flatten out in terms of, of how much the Biden administration is, is uh, releasing. They've even started to talk about actually purchasing back. So there's starting to be this, this shift in terms of the di demand dynamics mattering a bit less than the supply dynamics, which again, we haven't fixed anything there. There's still all those issues in terms of peak cheap energy and the arguments there. So there's plenty of reason to believe that, again, you know, leading to what I had just mentioned, that if the Federal Reserve started to ease on the margin in 2023, we could easily see energy you know, it's at $75 right now. We could easily see it back above 100. And that's going to have a cascading effect across all these other different components of inflation as well. So that, for all those reasons, is why I believe that, you know, on a, on a short to medium term basis, we're going to continue to see growth slow down surprises as this recession starts to unfold. That's going to have an effect on uh, surprisingly, you know, we might see all out uh, a couple months of all out month over month uh, deflation. Uh, you know, on an annualized basis, you know, my my shorthand framework is around three to four uh, percent headline inflation for, for on a year over year basis, uh, but having some month over month deflationary aspects. But that moving forward on that longer term basis, again, we haven't fixed anything. We've just suppressed demand. So that could easily shift that if we started to ease on the margin and be forced to. That's why I could see re, uh, CPI rebound back further. And if you start to continue to play this game of extrapolation out, you could see how, oh, look, we're just tracking the 1970s again, where we're going into uh, having high inflation. Oh, we hike, 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 hike. Oh, something's breaking. Oh, we're going back up. And then CPI rises again. And that's exactly what happened in the 70s. So despite the fact that Powell doesn't want to be an Arthur Burns and be the one who you know, has apparently pivoted into inflation and made it worse, and he wants to be his hero, uh, Paul Volcker. The fact is that, you know, these are the dynamics at play. And, you know, we're all just participants in this game theory of markets. And, and that's how I see it all playing out. Right. I just want to explain a point you made about mm -hmm. month over month consumer price inflation versus year over year. I'm just going to make this number up. But let's say in 
January 2023, the CPI index, and it is you know, a real number, is at 106. And then in February, it's at 105.8. That is a month-over-month decline, but that you have to mm-hmm. compare February 2023 to January, February 2022. And you know, again, made-up numbers, let's say February 2022 is at 100, so that's still a 5.8 year-over-year increase, even though you have month-over-month uh, deflation. Okay, Felix, what about China? Because I, you know, the U.S. is, in my opinion clearly going to go into a recession um, mm-hmm. and it's not looking good. Uh, so that would be a very bearish picture for commodities. However, uh, Europe is in a bad way and they still need commodities. And China is also in an extremely bad way. But remember, if something's in a, in a recession, that's actually bullish for com- it's you know if they're at the bottom of the cycle, their demand will only go up. You know, whereas now America is quote doing okay, but it's only going to get worse from here. Whereas in China, things are so bad and they might get better. I've had some recent guests on who disagree with that, but uh, yeah, you know, China China is a big uh, d- it devours coal, natural gas, oil. So what's your outlook on that? Oh, and also you know China has uh, it, it appears they have. L- Open. left behind their mm-hmm. policy of shutting down the economy to uh, uh, re- restrict the, the spread of, of uh, you know what. <sighs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, these are these are great points. And again, these these get to the fact that, you know, fundamentally, I'm still incredibly bullish on, you know, energy and commodities. And and these are also more further contributing reasons why I see that even though for the next six months, I see, you know, surprises to the downside and in inflation. Because of aspects that you've just mentioned, like the fact that, you know, China spe- is generally speaking, and especially paired with the fact that we're seeing this reopening from them, they're they're f- a bit further along in this business cycle than we are in the West. So so that paired with what's happening with the demand coming online of if they reopen their economy, again, like you just said, that's a huge bit for commodities and, and energy. So so that paired with the fact that, you know, as we as we start to go through the winter in Europe, obviously, we, we just barely got you know, through having enough energy for this winter, just barely, but they're going to have to start to to refill their energy reserves thinking for next winter. Um, and that's going to also provide a bit regardless. And the fact is, you know, we're not talking about it anymore, but Nord Stream is still down. Like there's not even an option potentially to open those up. So there's going to be some big headaches in terms of, of, of getting that those commodities that these countries need. And that just reiterates my, my thesis that, you know, if, if I think that, you know, Q1 2023 is going to be the bottom and it's going to be triggered by some sort of uh, event on the long end of the yield curve or potentially on the short end, the first thing I'm buying is energy and I'm buying it hand over fist because, again, we haven't fixed anything in the supply dynamics. We've just barely suppressed it. And the second that we pivot there, well, over here in China with demand coming online, well, you know, inflation is just going to get worse. And we're, we're living in this world of, of uh, scarcity of, of commodities now. And, you know, all these countries are going to have to fend for themselves, you know, somewhat as we see globalization start to peak out. So those are all, you know, fundamentally bullish factors that make me think that the first thing I'm buying is commodities when we bought them. Thanks, Felix. Now let's move on to your medium term outlook on risk assets. So we have this environment that, you know, if you're right, liquidity will continue to decline. Uh, Inflation will in the short term decline, perhaps even get month over month deflation for the consumer price index. What are the assets that perform well, poorly, horribly, amazingly over the next, let's say, uh, you know, six to 12 months and feel free to specify the time horizon if you say well actually no three months over four mm-hmm. months uh and also you know, i'll just you can pick whatever you want but i'll just throw through at you you know stocks bonds you know long-term government bonds short-term government bonds uh gold bitcoin oil the kathy wood arc etf mm-hmm. uh technology stocks what, what what do you what do you think sure yeah let's go through the full gamut so <laughs> <laughs> um Equities, you know, again, like I explained at the onset of the of this discussion, has been so much tracking uh, liquidity dynamics, or at least expectations of liquidity dynamics, paired with these idiosyncratic events like CPI or FOMC meetings, generally speaking. Um, as well, obviously, there's a third portion of that, which is, you know, the valuation framework of, uh, you know, if, we're, if, if we have uh, a, a one-year bond uh, trading at, uh, you know, with a yield above 4%, you know, that's going to make the opportunity cost of equities, the hurdle rate to decide to actually own equities quite a lot harder than it was a year ago. So there's there's fundamental bearish uh, tailwinds towards equities that make it difficult to rationalize on that valuation basis, as well as the fact that liquidity is still deteriorating. Um, 
both of those reasons, uh, plus, you know, the fact that if we, you know, just skipping a little bit forward, if, if the long end U.S. Uh, Treasury market starts to go unhinged and start to explode higher, you know, that's that's going to cause a downside to, to equities and, and risk assets as well. So I'm generally, you know, quite bearish on equities for the next six months. But, you know, I do think that, you know, somewhere around February or March, they're, they're a really great buy. Um, commodities, again, like I just explained, uh, you know, that's the Wait, first so, thing sorry, that so I'm, you bearish over the mm-hmm. next six months, but somewhere in February or March, you think they're a great buy. Can you square that with me? So you think once they crash, if they crash, that's a good opportunity. Yeah, I do. Because, you know, again, for me, the, the, the biggest framework for me is just uh, liquidity dynamics or expectations of it. So if we assume that something occurs on the long hand that brings the Federal Reserve in, that's going to ease liquidity conditions. So with that happening, then it makes sense to be a buyer of equity just to basically chase chase those uh, tailwinds of a further upside drive by uh, liquidity. Right. And I just want to point out, though, that that is, first of all, we don't know if there will be an implosion in, in long term. No. Japanese no. government bonds, let alone American bonds. And you're sort of pricing in that the Federal Reserve does something that they haven't done in 80 years or something. So it's it's a it is a uh, you know, it's not it's not guaranteed, basically. So no, so so what happens if the Federal Reserve doesn't do yield curve control? And uh Jay Powell's like, yeah, so there's a little bit of illiquidity in the treasure market. Who cares? If they if they don't, yeah. So again, it's an if then statement for myself for equities. And if they don't do that, then there's a lot of arguments to be made that equities don't make sense here, especially when you could go to the short end and, and, and get a pretty, you know, decent, you know, 4% yield on your cash there. That that makes a ton more sense to sit there and ride out the storm than going to buy equities. So if that does not occur, those, uh, you know, tell risk events that again, I, I totally admit that's, uh, that's pretty, a lot of things have to occur for that to happen. Um if if they don't happen, then I don't see myself buying equities. I see myself, uh, you know, either parking in commodities, uh, again, because of the fundamental uh, supply reasons that I had explained that we haven't fixed. Uh, I think those are a great buy. Uh, you know, up until basically last night when we saw the announcement from the Bank of Japan, I've been super bullish on, on long duration bonds because of this uh, faster than expected growth slowdown. But that I'm starting to rethink that argument because of the fact that we could see this dynamic where US dollars coming down while yields are still going up higher. So I'm starting to to have a little bit more trouble thinking that the owning long duration bonds makes sense. But I think the short end is still a great buy here. Um, you know, especially as we start to approach uh, that terminal rate, you know, if, if, if we call it that it's either one more hike of 25 bips or maybe 50 or so, um, it makes a ton of sense to buy the short end here and and basically weather out the storm there. Um, again, for as I explained at the, at the onset, for myself, my I have I have fundamental you know bullish views on on crypto and turn and and Bitcoin and everything in terms of uh, the t- technological potential. But those are my philosophical views. They're not my my trading or, or capital allocation views. My capital allocation views are purely as a, a speculative engine for liquidity dynamics moving forward. So again, it's it's an if then statement. If you know some sort of tail risk event occurs in uh, you know worldwide uh, fixed income markets, uh, so- sovereign fixed in- income markets. Then and I and I see the action start to happen where where central banks start to ease on the margin. Well, then I'm going to be a big buyer of crypto. But if that is not happening, I'm not a huge buyer, and I'm going to I'm going to wait for that to happen. So I I can't predict the future entirely. These are obviously pretty large tail risk events. So for me, it's an if then statement. I'm sitting on the sidelines, and if that happens, then I know exactly what I'm buying. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, you know I'm happy to sit. Uh, you know, basically pretty heavily in cash or short end uh, T-bills uh, as well as some commodities once I feel that, you know, the, the cycle of pricing in a recession has has nearly ended. Because again, we haven't fixed anything for uh, supply dynamics. Right. That makes sense. Can, can you explain the time horizon for commodities pricing in a recession? Because it seems like if you believe in deflation on the over at least over the short term, commodities kind of have to go down, right? They do. But, you know, they've commodities have, have led uh, this 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 pivot towards uh, you know a change in in CPI on a month to month basis. It's you know markets again are always forward looking. So if I assume the fact that you know copper and everything started to come down a lot you know very quickly months before uh, CPI started to roll over, well then the same is going to be uh, said for for moving forward. Is that as we see you know CPI bottom out, C- uh, commodities might already start to rise. So for me again, that's that's where I could see. 
And, you know, obviously we get into the argument of we could see like an idiosyncratic, uh, you know, correlation to one's sort of market crash. That's always a possibility. But putting that aside, you know, I see it as being a great time to, to buy those commodities in, you know, January to February and holding those, you know, effectively until we repeat the cycle where we start to to get that upswing and then CPI starts to, to rise again higher and, and actually reach the previous highs, you know, potentially sometime in, in 2024. So, you know, they would be a great uh, year to year and a half hold uh, on that basis. Right. I I get that for a lot of commodities, there is a significant lag between when the commodity price goes up and when consumers feel it in their pocketbook, like the price of copper, aluminum, you know, Mm -hmm. many months delay, maybe even a year delay, who knows. Um, But for natural gas, oil, and specifically gasoline, that's felt almost immediately. So I I feel like to have a core, to to have headline CPI deflation, Mm -hmm. I feel like the the price of gasoline and oil and natural gas still, you know, has to continue to decline. No, it would. So, you know, I, just just to, to clarify, I think core CPI, especially because of of goods and services, I think, and and shelter, those three components will add to a significant uh, component of month over month deflation. But we've already seen a lot of that month over month deflation attributed from energy. So I think that has largely already occurred. So again, to your point, it could make sense. And 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 you are right that energy has had a, a lot of a shorter lead time in terms of how it affects inflation. Again, that would so you know my argument would be that that would be the first one to buy, and it would be sooner than later. But again, yeah, moving out on the curve, some of those uh, other commodities, like say copper or something like that, that is one that you could buy with a little bit of a slightly longer lag time uh, to CPI. But, you know, well said that uh, oil does track it a lot closer. And and that a lot of that action has already been, uh, you know, attributed into the CPI on a headline basis. Got it. Uh, thanks, Felix. It's, it's great having you on Forward Guidance. People can find you on Twitter at FeeJau underscore Inc. F-E-J-A-U underscore I-N-C. The final question for you is about crypto. So let's say you're right that the Federal Reserve sort of stimulates everything in early 2023 and you know everything's a buy. ARK's a buy, Bitcoin's a buy, Ethereum's a buy, um, you know, any sort of tech stock that's growing a lot but has no hope of ever making a profit, it's a it's a huge buy, let's say. They do very well in that environment. So liquidity is high, but what if there are specific uh, microeconomic fundamental problems within the CFI, centralized finance ecosystem of crypto. So for example, just because the Fed is printing a ton of money, if every crypto lender within crypto uh, has hidden losses on their balance sheet <laughs> that will you know, take months and perhaps years to realize, how bullish can you be on crypto? So I guess that's a sort of long-winded way of asking you about the fall of FTX, the fate of Genesis, crypto lender that now right. hangs in the balance, Binance, where you know rumors are, are spreading around. It, you know, it used to be called FUD, fear of uncertainty and doubt. Now uh, mm-hmm. people are a little bit less uh, uh, hasty to use that term. But yeah, just what do you think about the microeconomic structure of crypto? Totally. Well... You know, when, when FDX's balance sheet got leaked and it turned out to just be a lot of um, altcoins, ones that they had created themselves, like FTT, there was, there was no Bitcoin and there was no Ethereum on their balance sheet. They had already sold it. They didn't own any of it. So a lot of these, you know, problem companies that are, are blowing up, they, they have a lot of effect on some of these more esoteric altcoins. But you can make an argument in terms of pure supply dynamics that a lot of the actual supply of, you know, if, if we assume, say, FDX had gone bankrupt and we need to, you know, liquidate the entire portfolio of crypto assets, well, they would have no Bitcoin or Ethereum to actually liquidate because they didn't own any when that happened. So from that pure perspective, and obviously there's the argument of what could happen with Genesis um, and Grayscale. And, you know, if they have to unwind Grayscale, that's a whole other issue. And that would totally, you know, invalidate my thesis. Um, you know, just to quickly explain that is that, uh, they would they would effectively have to liquidate their fund, and depending on how that actually occurs, you know that could lead to a huge uh, selling moment of uh, Bitcoin uh, on the market. Uh, so, the, so obviously that would create very idiosyncratic issues. But you know, putting aside that tail risk and, and just assuming, okay, Genesis goes bankrupt, but you know they can save Grayscale, all these other you know CFI lending platforms and FTX, none of them actually own the majors anymore. They all are, are just like locked up, you know, Solana and FTT and that sort of thing. Well, then there actually starts to be an interesting argument that we've actually seen a lot of that self-pressure already in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, 
and those could be a buy. So, you know, I, I definitely don't think it's the time to go out and buy esoteric altcoins uh, and, you know, just like max out your risk curve there. I think there's there's both fundamental uh, and liquidity reasons to, to actually be a buyer of Bitcoin and Ethereum, because when you really dig into the weeds, a lot of that selling has actually already occurred. Uh, you know, the biggest tell rest for me for crypto is actually what we've been talking about is just this correlation to one type of market crash and how that affects the majors. But in terms of the microstructure, you could argue Assuming if we pretend that grayscale will not crash, that's probably the only one tail risk. But other side, aside of that, I think a lot of the selling has already occurred there. And you know, there's there's a there's a lot of people that are going to want to own Ethereum and Bitcoin eventually once we we see the sea change. Um, and there's you know tons of opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, I agree with your final comment. I remember bear market of 2018. Seems like no one. No one liked crypto, and uh, the people mm-hmm. who liked it the least were the ones who, you know, months ago were the, the most bullish on it. But uh, hope springs eternal. Yeah, I, I definitely think there will be a next cycle. Um, you know, at, at Thanksgiving, I did uh, make a one dollar bet with my uncle that Bitcoin would <laughs> would reach all new new all time highs by the end of twenty twenty five. So, you know, I could lose that dollar, but but we'll see. Okay, so you're you're saying that if all of these exchanges are frauds and they don't actually have the Bitcoin. Let's say I have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum. We think it's at exchange XYZ. It's not. Then there is no yeah. Bitcoin to sell for, for XYZ. But doesn't well, that raise larger problems to just about the <laughs> ecosystem? Sorry, for, for FTX, Binance, you know, they, well, we assume they and have seen, largely speaking, that they own that Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, definitely not saying about that side of, and, you know, I don't really have an opinion on the, the Binance thing. I think it's too early to tell and there's yeah. way too many or, uh, rumors swirling. So not even going to unpack that kind of worms. But when I look at the facts of what has been un, unfolded, um, to me, those those say more has been sold than actually is left to sell, um, generally speaking. But of mm-hmm. course, like you said, <laughs> if we start to unpack those those cans of worms and see that there's there's all these other dynamics, well, yeah, I'm causing myself a lot of headaches when I could just go buy calls, long dated calls on NASDAQ and ride the same wave. So, you know, there's an argument to be made there that, uh, you know, if, if we go out into this all out liquidity inflection point to buy some crypto, but also go buy, uh, you know, some tech stocks and, and some Kathy Wood stocks, that probably also makes a lot of sense as well, just to, to diversify uh, away from those sort of idiosyncratic microstructure risks. And just to, thanks for clarifying that, Felix, just to make sure when you're saying you, you're going, you there may be a time you get bullish on ARC, Bitcoin, technology stocks, that would have to be a time in which there's a lot of market volatility and the Federal Reserve pivots. You're, there's, yeah. It's extremely unlikely that you will get bullish on any of those assets unless there's a major change in central bank policy, just to be clear. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, for me, they're just speculative vehicles on liquidity. Um, I'm not bothered as much with the fundamental, uh, you know, technological thesis is behind uh, Kathy Wood's uh, stocks. It's it's a speculative vehicle. And I think that's what a lot of market participants have, you know, basically adopted those, those uh, tickers as they just, you know, Nobody wants to actually admit that fact, but that's yeah. a lot of what has yeah, yeah, happened. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. You know, there's some people say, "Oh, stocks are a projections mm-hmm. of future cash flows. You only do yeah. fundamental analysis." Uh, you're saying it's a speculative vehicle. You know, some might say the first method is is uh, preferable to your method. I think Felix, though, by far, by far, the most dangerous thing is to be in the middle where you tell yourself yeah. and you tell other people that you're a fundamental analyst, but really you're not, and you're in it for the for the. The uh, the punt, as they 100%, say, hundred percent. Just be just be honest with yourself and your intentions. You know, yeah, you could know. you could go around some discounted cash flows on some value stocks, but also admit to the fact of yourself that you're buying, you know, these hyper growth assets for different reasons. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, it's, it's <laughs> great to have you on. Uh, tell us about reflexivity research. What's the kind of research that you do, and where can people find your work? Yeah, so reflexivity research is a, a digital asset first a research firm. Uh, that we founded that on a weekly basis, we we cover basically a holistic uh, approach to, to different subjects. So I cover on a weekly basis the macro side of things, but uh, you know I'm, I'm just as crypto native as, as anybody else out there and definitely passionate about that side as well. Uh, we also have a team of other analysts that are specialized in, in DeFi, um, you know, in on-chain activity dynamics and on-chain analysis. Um, NFTs, we, we basically cover the gambit. And really our value proposition is, is bringing that crypto native knowledge, you know, overlaid with, with some of the, the dynamics and insights that I bring from the macro side of things to deliver this, this, you know, holistic package to effectively, 
you know, other traditional firms that are coming from the traditional finance landscape and starting to move into the digital asset uh, landscape. So that's really the section that we're playing in. And we just, uh, you know, aim to provide the best research we can on a weekly basis. Um, you know, so we provide, you know, at least three reports every week, uh, you know, weekly analyst calls where we all break down our reports uh, with members and have open Q&A with them. Uh, but it's really just about, you know, creating as, as professional as possible of a research firm to, to get more people onboarded into that digital asset landscape. Thanks, Felix. Talk soon. All right. Thanks so much.